Mary and Elizabeth were Jewish women of color, dark eyes, dark hair. And one must recognize that racial identity and cultural context had great significance when it came to motherhood. Giving birth was a dangerous thing in antiquity. Mortality rates were high, especially among teen mothers. And in ancient Palestine, women ordinarily married at about 13 years old in order to maximize childbearing. Thus Mary's engagement at such an age, such a young age, hence having a baby as a teenager. But life was hard for Mary. She spoke Aramaic with a Galilean accent, belonged to the peasant class, made a living through agriculture, which we all know is hard work. And so the image of this holy family of three in this tranquil, monastic, like carpenter shop is highly problematic and highly improbable. Most likely they lived in some sort of communal living with extended family. And those, under those realities, Mary raised the child under such oppressive circumstances. She struggled to pay her taxes. And yet, Elizabeth's favor Mary, mother-to-be, wife of a priest, becomes a shield of protection, becomes an advocate for this pregnant, unwed teenager. Did you hear me? Essentially, Elizabeth stands in solidarity with Mary. And solidarity somehow opens the eyes of Elizabeth to see the divine in Mary. I wonder how many of us are standing in solidarity with others because when one stands in solidarity with others one's eyes are open to see the divine in others there is great power in solidarity so much so that it inspired Mary to sing a song but just not any song a song of liberation you know the song is known as the Magnificat this song has become a symbol of liberation, a clear stance against the Roman imperial values of her day, a symbol of resistance to the oppressive empires of her world, a declaration that not one more soul will be humiliated. It has become a freedom song for the poor, the oppressed, especially in places like Latin America. And so it would be, right? Mary was the epitome of the marginalized society. She represented the lowliest of Jewish society. Remember, there was no room in the inn, right? God was her only hope. You know, I guess what I'm submitting to you this morning is that Mary's song of liberation, this song of freedom, it is rooted in pain, in suffering, and in hardship. Can you identify with the Blessed Mother? The image of Mary with a raised clenched fist says a thousand words. One of my favorite theologians, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the theologian martyr who was executed by the Nazis, spoke these words in a sermon during Advent in 1933. He said, the song of Mary is the oldest Advent hymn. It is at once the most passionate, the wildest, one might even say the most revolutionary Advent hymn ever sung. This is not the gentle, tender, dreamy Mary whom we sometimes see in paintings. This is that passionate, surrendered, proud, enthusiastic Mary who speaks out here. This song has none of the sweet, nostalgic, or even playful tones of some of our Christmas carols. It is instead a hard, strong, and not exuberant song about collapsing thrones and humble lords of this world, about the power of God and the powerlessness of humankind. And my question for us this morning is shall we join Mary's Advent Freedom Song? A song that prophesizes that a new world is coming. That a new order of things is coming. For marginalized communities, 
for the poor, the black and brown, the indigenous, the people of color, the queer community, the refugee and migrant communities, and all other oppressed groups and communities, shall we sing Mary's Advent song of liberation? This should be our song of the world to come. This should be our anthem, our cry for liberation of God's resistance to the imp impressive, oppressive powers of this world. God is the protector of the poor. God is the defender of the oppressed. I wonder if you've seen the images of thousands of people trekking from Central America. The facts say that nearly 400,000 Central American migrants come to the American borders each year. Because of poverty, food insecurity, climate shocks and violence, they are forced to look elsewhere. It's not a matter of choice for many. And when I hear political rhetoric, I just shake my head. Do they even understand the massive dangers of such a trip? It has probably took Mary five days to get to Elizabeth, and it takes much longer for migrants to make it to the American borders and many do not even make it. And yet politicians, state governors, and others abuse, exploit, and mis mistreat these migrants. Do they even see God in those human beings? Or are they simply political pawns to get more votes for the next election? You know, you gotta remember, what were the true motivations uh, for the Roman Empire's requirement of a census? The true motivations were to count the number of able-bodied men who could be drafted for war. The true motivations were to, to determine the number of taxpayers in every location. Essentially, the census was designed to benefit the empire's military strength and its economic power. And I shake my head. Beloved people of God, students of Jesus, whether you're here for the first time or you've been here many times, we must look deeper to see God in one another. The divine is at work in our relationships. And when we see the image of God in one another, we set into motion a whole new 